patient doesn't suffer. So various uh, 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 aspects of how to use a small pu uh, use rings in a small pupil, how to manage in case of a subluxated lens, how to what type of lens to be used. Uh, there are multiple uh, things which comes to mind for a for uh, for a general ophthalmologist, and this is what we have aimed to achieve in this uh, uh, session. Uh, first speaker is a very eminent ophthalmologist from the armed forces, Brigadier V.K. Barnwal. He has got loads of experience in uh, doing cataract surgeries. He has done multiple years. He has been uh, at various centers. He's uh, uh, been head of the department at base hospital. And his immense uh, administrative uh, load, he has been director of Sitapur Eye Hospital. So uh, notwithstanding that, uh, he is going to speak on superior or temporal incision in cataract surgery, a case-based approach. Brigadier V.K. Barnwal, sir. Uh, first of all, I must thank Brigadier Sanjay Mishra for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, present my, the topic given to me in front of you. The topic is superior versus uh, temporal phaco incision. <coughs> I have no financial disclosures. Uh, the importance of wound construction in uh, cataract surgery is uh, well depicted by the slogan, well begun is half done by Aristotle. some problem in the huh. because the FACO wound construction lays down the fine foundation for subsequent steps of the FACO surgery uh, it influences the fluid balance in the anterior segment <coughs> then it is a it has a immediate uh, role important role in the post-operative period when the wound is unstable it helps to prevent post-operative infections. It ensures smooth and faster recovery. And last but not the least, it is a refractive tool for the pre-existing astigmatism. <coughs> Few things about the astigmatism. Just to recapitulate, vertical meridian is something which is vertically, that is 90 degrees plus minus 20 degrees. Then the horizontal meridian is horizontally in the horizontal axis that is 182 plus minus 20 degrees. It is the, and the rule is uh, vertical with the, with the rule astigmatism, which means the vertical meridian is uh, 0.25 diopters, normally steeper than the horizontal meridian. This is uh, supposed to be due to the pressure of the eyelids on the eyeball. And secondly, the vertical Diameter of the cornea is about one millimeter shorter than the horizontal one. <coughs> then there are two main types of astigmatism with the rule astigmatism in which the steeper meridian is at in the vertical or the 90 degree meridian. This is much more common in young and myopes. Whereas against the rule astigmatism where the steeper curve or axis is against the, is the, along the 180 degree this is more common in the elderly. The exact cause is actually not known, but it is supposed to be due to change in the pressure of the eyelids over a period of time as the age advances and change in the uh, stromal collagen fibers, which cause a shift from with the rule to the against the rule astigmatism. Then what are the important factors which influence astigmatism? First is the location. We'll discuss it out in the subsequent sli uh, slides. Then second is size of the incision. It is estimated that 1.8 to 2.8 millimeter incision, phaco incision induces relatively small uh, surgical, uh, surgically induced astigmatism. However, further re reduction in this size has only uh, limited benefit. Similarly, the incision, phaco incision length, it is estimated that shorter tunnel less than 1.75 millimeter 
causes very minimal uh, surgically induced astigmatism. Then distance from the center of the cornea as you go to, uh, towards the periphery, the more peripheral incision causes less astigmatism. And another factor is multiplanar uh, FACO incisions are better compared to uni and biplanar incisions as far as the astigmatism is concerned. <coughs> A study by Archana Sunil Ekos et al. published in Clinical Ophthalmology in 2018 has suggested that temporal clear corneal incision induces less surgically induced astigmatism as compared to the superior incisions. Uh, the landmark study as far as astigmatism because of the FACO incision is concerned is by Jaime Tedzor and Juan Murabe published in way back in May 2005. This is the goals, uh, the criteria mentioned in this study are being followed worldwide even now. We'll be discussing it within the subsequent slides. <coughs> as far as the temporal corneal incisions are concerned, as we have discussed it out, it induces lower surgically induced astigmatism because incision is located at a more distance compared to the, from the central visual axis as compared to the superior incision. Also, it is better, especially in cases where you have a prominent eyebrow and deep set eye. And it reduces existing against the rule astigmatism. <coughs> Then the other recommendations for temporal incisions are pre-existing with the rule astigmatism of, of less than 1.5 diopters or pre-existing astigmatism of less than 0.75 diopters or negligible pre-existing astigmatism. <coughs> then coming to the superior corneal incisions, the advantages are, the main advantage is that the incision is protected under the upper eyelid, so chances of infection are less. However, it induces more corneal flattening and surgically induced astigmatism and it is difficult in prominent eyebrows and deep set eyes because the movement of the probe becomes difficult. So it is recommended for with the rule astigmatism of more than 1.5 diopters. <coughs> then few considerations beyond astigmatism. A study by Hamid Gare et al. published in Journal of Ophthalmic and Vision Research has suggested that superotemporal incisions, uh, they cause less uh, corneal endothelial loss, cell loss. However, the difference is not much uh, significant. Another study by Mohammed Anbar Hatim Amar published in BMC Journal of Ophthalmology suggested that the temp whether it is you do a temporal incision, superior, superotemporal, it does not affect the IOP, bleb morphology or function after one year follow-up. A study by Snehal Vaskar published in Med Pulse in 2014 has uh, the, it suggests that incision location, whether it is superior, temporal, superotemporal has no Final, uh, no bearing on the final best visual equity after a, in the long run. <coughs> as far as deep set eyes and prominent eyebrows are concerned, the main challenges as you all know are difficult probe angulation, fluid pooling and reduced visibility while operating. In these cases, temporal approach is better. <coughs> and in cases of pre-existing corneal opacity, the site selection depends on the location of the corneal opacity and where maximum clear cornea is available. Aim is uh, to orient the phaco probe so that tip is visible in the pupillary area, the clear area. And phaco is carried out in opacity free area. As far as pre existing overhanging uh, trabeculectomy bleb is concerned, as you can see, the temporal approach is much easier and better. Another concern is there is something called as negative dis uh, photopsias. Uh, this is supposed to be uh, due to the, the uh, edema at the incision site, especially seen in the temporal uh, corneal incisions. However, luckily uh, it dis disappears when the edema at the incision site disappears. 
usually takes about a week, so not of much problem or significance in the long run. Uh, as far as uh, the whether we, we one has to do a superior FACO incision, temporal, superior temporal, actually one should be uh, position the FACO machine, microscope, and the chair and the trolley in such a way that one can manu uh, manipulate or whether to do from the superior uh, part or the temporal incision because the you, you have to minimize the astigmatism. So for that, uh, the surgeon also requires a positive mindset, practice, and comfort. The steps to the in decrease the pre-existing astigmatism, the most important is incision should be given on the steeper axis. And if astigmatism is up to one diopters, incision, uh, extension of incision by four millimeters or pair and paired incision, incision on the opposite axis, both the superior and the inferior also at the same axis can correct astigmatism up to one diopters. And if you give more peripheral incisions, it causes less astigmatism. And if astigmatism is more, then you have to use the toric levels. The take home message, the incision size or choice of the incision actually depends on the surgeon's preference based on his comfort, mindset, familiarity, equipments, and the OT size. Suppose the size of the OT is very small, you don't have place to maneuver the, uh, the uh, OT trolley or the microscope or the FACO machine or the operating chair, you don't have much choice. Second is the patient anatomy, that is prominent eyebrows, deep set eyes. For this, the temporal incision is better. Then pre-existing astigmatism, pre-existing ocular disease like pterygium, corneal opacity, panis, and previous ocular surgeries or trauma. <coughs> but for a general purpose and at a uh, eye volume center, simplest is a clear corneal phaco incision along the steeper manidium. This is the easiest and the best one can do. Thank you. Thank you so much. For the con Thank you, sir. We'll take the question at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much, sir. I would like to add just one more point that just don't uh, blindly follow that you have to do a temporal or a super incision. You have to practice in both settings, that is temporal as a superior. You should be expert so that you're not uncomfortable if you are given a choice of doing in any of these positions. And you should make it a habit to look at your IOL power sheet. Very, very important. Just go, don't go blindly by what power is required. You see which, which is the steep axis and take the incision on the steep axis. Next uh, presentation is by Kalan Sandeep Gupta. He's going to speak on small pupil management to use iris capsule hooks or rings. Kalan Sandeep Gupta is a prolific uh, cataract, refractive, and uh, cornea surgeon. He has done his fellowship from, from RP Center, uh, Delhi, and he has loads of experience in cataract, refractive, and lamellar, and all types of uh, corneal surgeries. Consent you, please. Thank you, sir, for this opportunity. Sir, is, there is no clear cut ans answer to what to use in small pupils. So if you see the roadmap, the things which are available are mediatric and NACI, NACI drops. Now, intracameral lidocaine with phenylephrine is available. But still, you have situations where these things don't work. Then, then you have the choice of viscometriasis versus a mechanical stretching of the pupil. And the, then options which are available are iris hooks. And then you have pupillary expansion devices. So why we talk about small pupil? The reason is it is fairly common to have a small pupil in phacoemulsification. You have patients with pecs, the floppy iris syndrome, synechia, old age. People with, uh, on chronic neotics, they all come up with small pupils. And the problems are you have a lot of complications. Even in, even in people who are trained, people with, with lots of experience, you can have a rexis extension. You may land up in a small capsule rexis with the consequences. You may have iris prolapse leading to iris chaffing. PCR is common, nucleus drop. And definitely, you have a lot of iris handling leading to AC reaction. So that is the reason why we are interested in people with small pupil. Now, topical drops work up to a time, then you can have cohesive viscoelastics, or then you can stretch the pupil. But all these things are 
in to extend they work to up to extend there is there are situations where nothing works then you need to have a either a iris hook or a uh, pupillary expansion devices now iris hooks they are ubiquitously ubiquitous everywhere it is available very very cheap 200 to 300 rupees for a set of iris hooks and no extra instruments are required whereas most of the expansion devices you have to plan for them every ot doesn't have it it is not readily available they are relatively expensive compared to iris hooks and you need special devices either an injector or a forceps for most of the expansion devices now few few things you have to know you need to have corneal clarity for putting in a, a device which is a pupillary expansion device if you have corneal opacities definitely it will be difficult to put in a uh, or manipulate a pupil expansion device again when you have shallow ac probably both the situations don't work well however you may go in for a expansion device because either way when you put in a iris hook you make multiple incisions there is definitely going to be wound leak so this is again you should note these are the pre op factors you have to keep in mind when you are planning either of the two things then what is the need for dilatation sometimes we have a central corneal opacity we need to shift the focus away or the pupil away from the center that is the place probably you will prefer a iris hook rather than a pupillary expansion device patients who are prone to ocular inflammation a uh, uh, expansion device probably will be better because iris handling is definitely less and when you have synechia or rigid pupil uh, iris hook is definitely better i'll come to it later on so intraoperatively if you have a rigid pupil it is not dilating a pupillary expansion device will not give you expansion beyond 5 mm or maybe little more than that these are the situations where a iris hook will work better when you having wound leak already having a wound leak uh, probably a expansion device will be better because iris hooks either way contribute to wound leak and uh, ac shallowing so advantage of a iris hook is you can selectively isolate a field i'll come in a video later on if you have iridodialysis associated with the cataract a iris hook itself will help you hold on to the uh, uh, the loose iris it it and if you have a sub subluxated lens definitely iris hook will help because it'll it'll help you in giving capsular support also so whenever you have traumatic cataracts opacities a iris hook is definitely better pupillary expansion device as i said will not help in a very rigid pupil here it, it will not give you uh, dilatation beyond 4 mm and when you have a fixed dilatation definitely a expansion device will not be helpful so this is one video if you see it's a chronic mediatic people uh, with uh, pupillary membrane and if you just see the first thing you do is you do a select uh, mechanical stretching of the pupil i'm not i'll not go into the whole video so mechanical stretching can be done by using two sinski hooks but again it is a rigid pupil very floppy pupil and this is the place where if you put in a expansion device it will not give you much uh, expansion so better is to use multiple iris hooks so that you can expand the pupil very well but if you see what happens with iris hooks you you have multiple entries and this is the risk of post op inflammation infection and definitely a uh, wound leak definitely goes up so this is one case where you can now after iris hooks you can easily go ahead and do the surgery a expansion device will not work in a case like this where uh, Uh, the pupil is already very rigid but the risk with iris hooks is you see the iris is elevated ac becomes shallow the risk of corneal damage post operatively is definitely more than a pupillary expansion device and again since ac is shallow there is al uh, always a wound leak so surgery becomes little difficult in a scenario like this so this is another case where you have a central corneal opacity now you can't put in a pupillary expansion device here ideally speaking this is a case for triple procedure but if you are going ahead with a cataract in this you basically need something to isolate the field away from the central opacity now this is a central opacity if you use iris hooks on the on the periphery now this is we are using the iris hooks and you can you can see you can easily make space here and you can operate here so in these scenarios when you have a opacity you definitely can't use a pupillary expansion device the surgery can be done but in such a scenario definitely iris hook is any day better but apart from these two scenarios most of the times a pupillary expansion device works any day better because of multiple reasons i'll come to that now when you have a iris hook you have multiple entries risk of iris prolapse iris chafing post op infection and inflammation definitely goes up to a very high level and post op pupillary deformation is there people doesn't come back to the normal shape and you have traumatic mitriasis you have uh, later on dysphotopsia as well as glare which is very very common 
With a pupil pupillary expansion device, you definitely have a learning curve. However, a single entry is there. Pupil and the sphincter is definitely spared. So these are the advantages of having a pupillary expansion device. Now, this is another case where you have a pex with a small pupil and a very hard cataract. So what you can do is it is very easy. Through the main wound only, you can just put in a pupillary expansion device. I am a proponent of a BHAX. I no proprietary interest. I love this device because it is so simple and no extra instruments are required and you can easily manipulate. So just put in through your main wound, you put in a BHEX and with a simple intravitreal forcep, you can just put the flanges inside underneath the iris and it gives you a beautiful hexagonal uh, dilatation. And you can easily do any surgery through this uh, uh, device and no extra instruments, no extra this thing and just a lovely dilatation is available with a BHEX. Very easy to do and, and adequate dilatation is there and you can easily finish off the surgery. And once you finish off the surgery, it is very easy to remove also. You don't have to do anything extra, just pull the uh, uh, BHEX and it, it just comes out. And usually you do it after putting in the IOL. AC is well formed, pupil is, uh, pupil is not deformed, pupil and uh, post-op uh, reaction is definitely less. You don't have iris pull, especially in cases of uh, floppy iris. So that way, it is, there is an advantage of using, using a BXC. It is so comfortably, now the pupil will constrict uh, later on. So this is again just, uh, another, another case where you can see the BX is perfectly placed. And even if you have an iris prolapse, like in this case, there was iris prolapse, you can easily put the iris back. And since there is not much of wound leak, the iris, uh, the uh, pupil, will, uh, the iris will not prolapse again. And after putting the IOL, you can easily remove the BX again. And, and if you see, after removing the BX, the pupil definitely comes back, back to its normal position uh, in a uh, BX or a pupillary expansion device. So this is another case, just for example, in this case, there is no, uh, uh, pupil is well dilated, just to show the advantage of having a high risk. So once you have the subluxated cataract, after putting the iris hook, you can easily do a cataract surgery in this. So you, if you have a iridodialysis, if you have a, uh, a bag which is subluxated with a small pupil, having iris hook is definitely better than using an expansion device. So points to note is you should always have backup in your OT when you have a small pupil. You should have viscode, you should have expansion devices, capsular support in the form of CTR, and multi-piece IOL you should always have. And thinking ahead, when you evaluate a patient preoperatively, that is the time you need to decide what to do about such cases. So postoperatively, look for all these cases where you put in iris hook or expansion devices, you definitely are going to have chances of raised IOP more with iris hooks and definitely inflammation, again, more with iris hooks. So you have to do a SWOT analysis of your technique only. You should know what is what are your surgical skills. Do you have skills to put in expansion device? You should have protocols which are definitely tailored to yourself. Your staff should be trained. You should always have equipment which is ready with you. And ultimately, it is a complacency which leads to complications. So these are the threats you should always anticipate. So no small people should be taken lightly. So in the end, what I would like to conclude is you should need to have a good pre-op workup. That is what decides what to do post-operatively. Speak to the patients, tell them what you are going to do. Have your own protocol, whether you want to put in a iris hook or you want to put in an expansion device, that you have to decide yourself. Cover all possibilities and most importantly, pre-operatively advise the patient and post-operatively, you should never hide any complications and ultimately decision is yours. As depending on the situation, there is nothing called that this iris hooks can be used in all cases or pupillary expansion devices can be used in all the cases. So ultimately, uh, this is one slide which I show everywhere. Excellence is art won by training and habituation. We are what we repeatedly do. So basically excellence then is nothing but a habit. So more you do, more you get used to it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sandeep. It was a wonderful presentation. Uh, just uh, to add two points is that <clears throat> Always take a history of uh, uh, BPH in your patients, especially elderly. If you see that the pupil is not dilating preoperatively, just ask and invariably you'll find the answer that the patient is a uh, case of a BPH and is taking the prostate medicines. Secondly, if you have a small pupil, you have to use a dye. Please use dye before you're using Vistlon because once you use Vistlon, it becomes very difficult for the capsule to stain and take out the dye. These are my two small points. Sir, you have got any points, sir? Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Kal Vijay Kumar Sharma. Kal Vijay Kumar Sharma is going to speak on 
cystitum or forceps in capsular excess, which is better? Kal Vijay Kumar Sharma is uh, presently professor and head of the department at Army Os at AFMC. Pune is a prolific uh, cornea, refractive, and cataract surgeon. He is uh, alumnus of RP Center Ames and has many first to his credit. Uh, Vijay, without uh, wasting much time because we've got less time, so I'll ask you to give your presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the introduction. So I'll be speaking about uh, continu uh, continuous curvilinear capsular axis. So as all of you know that uh, uh, if you get a good CCC, the outcome of your phaco emulsification surgery will be very good. So uh, there are uh, uh, many individuals, rather most of people, they prefer cystitome over uh, forceps. So uh, which one is better in which scenario? So I'll be discussing about that. So as you know that uh, continuous curvilinear capsular axis, normally the size that we uh, want to achieve during surgery is around 5 to 5 point. 5 millimeter that should be roughly around 0.25 to 0.5 millimeters smaller than the optic size so that the IOL centration is very good. Now what is the basic difference between a cystitome and the forceps? In the cystitome what you are doing is you are uh, making a flap you are reflecting it over to the remaining capsule and in the same plane you are uh, doing the directed rexis by uh, dragging it over the uh, remaining capsule. Uh, whereas in forcep uh, uh, assisted uh, capsular axis, what you try to do is you lift the flap away from the uh, surface of the anterior surface of the crystalline lens. So by then directing that force, uh, by lifting it over to the anterior chamber, that is how you try to achieve the uh, continu uh, continuous curvilinear capsular axis. Now in both the techniques, as far as the normal uh, cases are concerned, uh, uh, routine cases are concerned, both techniques do equally well, whether you use a cystitome or you use a forceps. Uh, the difference start uh, coming in the outcome as soon as you get the hypermature cataracts or complicated cataracts. So that is the time when uh, you have to be very careful and uh, how you should go about, we'll see some of the cases. And also usually what is said that uh, uh, so these were the uh, uh, the videos which were uh, done using the cystitome. I'll just show you one video where uh, uh, normally we use the, now this is a utrata forcep which is used. So with the uh, tip of the utrata, you just make an initial uh, 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 incision in the caps uh, capsule and you can just lift it up and you can make the uh, size of the capsular axis that you want and uh, that you are convenient with. So. Uh, now this is, uh, let's discuss some other cases. Now this is a case of hypermature cataract. Now in this, in the center, you are seeing a, there is a very thick calcified anterior uh, capsule. So with the needle, when we try, uh, with the system, when we try, we are not able to make entry into that. So uh, there are two techniques described for this. One is either you peel off this uh, uh, calcified, uh, uh, calcified uh, uh, capsule or you make a, incision on the side of this if it is uh, uh, it can come in within the capsular excess margin and then you can use a uh, utrata forcep to do a good capsular excess in this. Be sure that uh, uh, during the uh, when you are doing a CCC if you are uh, uh, getting some extensions then you should add visco and then complete the rexis. Once you complete it then the further surgery becomes much easier uh, in these cases. So uh, I'll go to another next video. Now, uh, many a times it happens that in hypermature cataract, the intralenticular pressure is very high. Your cortex is highly liquefied. And in these cases, it is said that if you do a, uh, a rexis using a cystitome, then you get an Argentinian flag sign, much more uh, higher as compared to the rexis. I'm showing this video to show that you can get an Argentinian flag flag sign including uh, even with the utrata forcep. So that is why placement has to be. Now just see here, I'm going to the edge and as soon as I try to pull the capsule, extend it. So again, what comes to the rescue is uh, your forceps, how you can manage the forceps intraoperatively. So uh, what you do is, meanwhile, when we were trying to manage on one side, the intralenticular pressure was very high and then we, uh, the Argentinian flag sign happened on the other side also. There were two sides. So uh, then we uh, just use a MVR Caesar and uh, uh, then uh, extended that and then converted that into a round axis on that side 
and then we completed the FACO emulsification in this case. Uh, so uh, you have to be very careful, especially if you have got radial tears like this. So in those cases, you should be very careful. Now, uh, this direct chop, direct chop is quite safe. Once you do the direct chop, you can remove the entire nucleus. Uh, you have to be very careful. Don't let the AC collapse. So once you have completed the FACO emulsification, don't withdraw your FACO probe immediately. What you do is from the side port, you inject the viscoelastic so that your capsule doesn't come forward because you have a radial tear there. And then you come out, and uh, then you can complete the FACO emulsification even uh, if you have got radial tears in situations like this. So uh, let's go ahead to some other cases. So uh, this case, again, a case of uh, complicated cataract. You have got a very thick fibrous membrane here, and also you have got uh, uh, vascularization over to the anterior surface of the capsule from the iris. Now, uh, again, in such scenarios, you have to innovate in between. So uh, initially, the superficial membrane we removed using a MVR scissor and forceps. So after this uh, membrane is removed, we created a space so that we can now, you just see the how thick is the membrane. You can hardly pull it uh, uh, with a forcep also. So we created four places where we can insert the malignant ring. Once these places were, four uh, spaces were created, we uh, injected the malignant ring and uh, the scrolls were tucked in under the iris and we got at least a relatively decent dilatation at this point of time. Now the second challenge is to manage the thick fibrous membrane that we have. Now uh, in this, in such cases you can use a MVR. With MVR, these thick membranes you can gently lift and also peel off. So you just lift it and wherever it is attached to the remaining capsule, you just cut that place and once, uh, now you can see the uh, how thick is the membrane. So it's actually a fibrous membrane with the capsule, with the cortical matter. So all those have thickened into a thick membrane. And this is the site where the interlenticular vascularization was coming. So uh, that also we removed. And once this was completed, you keep on injecting visco so that you get a uh, good uh, uh, formed uh, anterior chamber during the entire surgery. Now this is the membrane with capsule with some cortex and once it, it is removed you can complete your phaco emulsification surgery ahead of this. And also we inserted the, uh, put the intraocular lens also without any complication in this. Okay, uh, let's see, this is my last uh, video. Now in this what you are seeing is a coloboma, 30 year old patient who had a coloboma, who had a very, very, uh, uh, it, it was a total cataract and also the membrane was very, very thick. Again, the same thing, the capsule, the cortex, everything was a one thick membrane. So we tried with the, initially with the cystidome. Now here we are trying with the forcep. We are not able to gain any entry into the capsule from where we can start a capsular axis. So what we did is, see now we are using a scissor also, but we are not able to get the scissor also into the, uh, this membrane. So again, we use a MVR blade made an entry and made an entry point into this thick membrane. Once we made this entry point, then we could insert the blades of your MVR scissor. Now, now, now we got at least one plane where we can do a capsular access in such a thick fibrous membrane. And uh, now you can see uh, after that, now we can hold it with a forcep. We can complete the, uh, the, we can complete the remaining capsular access in this. And uh, again, you have to be very uh, ambidextrous using the uh, MVR scissor, MVR, uh, uh, MVR forcep. You, sh you have to be very careful. And now once this membrane was removed, this patient also had a traction return detachment that was planned for a stage two surgery. So coloboma, uh, because of coloboma, we could not put a malignant ring in this. So we use the iris hooks in this because on one side iris is not present. So in such cases with malignant ring, what happens is intraoperatively with the fluidics, the malignant ring just gets uh, 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 removed out of the iris. So it's better to use in coloboma the iris hooks compared to your um, uh, rings. So uh, now once this was completed, then we removed the total cataract. The total cataract was removed. And after the cataract was removed, we could insert a foldable intraocular lens into this. And uh, so this is the last pieces. And so after putting the intraocular lens, now this remaining membrane we had kept very uh, uh, deliberately because we didn't want the extension of our uh, rexis margin. Now hardly there is any rexis, but this membrane were very tough. So whatever manipulation you do, nothing will extend. So after you have put the intraocular lens, the remaining cortex and the, uh, uh, the uh, capsular membrane that was present, that was also removed. And now the patient is planned for 
vitreoretinal surgery for traction retinal detachment after this. So with this, uh, uh, the take home message, what I would suggest is you need to be proficient in both the techniques. In a routine cases, both cystitome and forceps, they do equally well. But uh, forceps, they have an edge over cystitome, like in the cases I showed in pediatric cataracts, in hypermature cataracts, and in complicated cataracts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vijay. It was a wonderful presentation, Vijay. Seeing your videos, it was really, you get really awestruck how beautifully you've managed those complicated situations. Uh, I have uh, to add two more points in this. Uh, in, in case of, uh, uh, if you're doing a, using a forceps, uh, try using uh, 25 gauge forceps in the sense, uh, those ILM forceps, uh, serrated forceps, because you don't have to increase the wound size. So if you're using a forceps, a bigger forceps, then you have to uh, increase the wound size to 2.2 or 2.8. Then the, because uh, the AC becomes flat in those cases and then the chances of running of those rexes is quite high. Secondly, in case of a hypermature cataract, we have a very white and hypermature cataract when you suspect that the intralenticular pressure and the intravitreal pressure is also high in those cases. You just do a plain simple, put a non-vault trocar four millimeters from the limbus in infrotemporal quadrant. Just wait for some amount of vitreous to come out. Don't be scared. This may look initially scary, but it's a very, very useful tip. You all try it, and it's, it's going to be a very successful tip that you put a non-vault trocar 3.5 to 4 millimeters from the limbus in infrotemporal quadrant. Just wait for the vitreous to come out, and the eyes become immediately soft. The chances of rexes going out becomes very less. These are my two points. Uh, to add on these cases, but otherwise uh, Vijay has uh, shown that how beautiful surgeries this complicated surgeries can be. This next speaker is uh, Brigadier Gaurav Kapoor. Though he's not here, he's got an urgent work, so she will be represented by Major Shristi Kuller. She is clinical tutor at Department of AFMC in ophthalmology there. And uh, just to add a uh, few points for Shristi, Shristi is the First person in history of uh, medical, or I would say defense services that she represented. She's the first person from the armed forces to represent the all lady woman contingent on this 26th January. And she was uh, uh, awarded on the spot commendation by the chief of army staff. This is a very, very rare thing to happen. And my con congratulations and kudos to Shristi for, for working almost two, three months continuously from morning 3.30 a.m. to night, almost 6, 7, 7, 7 p.m. or so, and uh, marching almost 20 kilometers in a day. So it was a very, very difficult task, but she excelled in that. So, um, uh, Shristi, now you may please proceed with the presentation. Thank you very much, sir. So I'll be covering up for Gaurav, sir. So when it comes to any surgical procedure, the right set of skills need to be accompanied with the right set of instruments to have an uneventful surgery. So as we call it, necessity is the mother of all inventions. Dr. Gaurav, sir, uh, applied modifications to the existing design of chopper and dialer, and this was presented at the AISOC 2020, which received the best paper presentation in the cataract session, and was amongst the top five innovations at the Think Under the Apple Tree, and it has already received the patent. So surgeon experience is the most important factor when it comes to uh, outcomes of phaco emulsification. And uh, as reported in the literature, the rate of vitreous complication ranges from 2 to 14.7%. And it is even higher with first year residents or beginners like me. Even after complete, completing the rate limiting step, as I call it, that is the capsular rexis, things can still go downhill during nucleus handling, and uh, especially when it is unsupervised. So the idea of modification of this design was to increase the safety profile and to avoid complications that occur due to the instrument itself so as to achieve efficacy and efficiency of chopping. So these were the two modifications that were done in the existing design of the dialer and chopper. That is 110 degree forward angulation and 20 degree sideway angulation to increase the efficiency. So here's a small video showing that how it helped us to achieve better outcomes. Due to these little modifications in the angulation of the instrument, the axis of the dialer or chopper, whichever uh, one is comfortable to use, aligns with the axis of the phaco probe 
thereby easing out the breakage of nucleus and also preventing the distortion of the port, as you can very well see in this uh, video. So this is the side port, sideway angulation that is 20 degree, and this is 110 degree uh, forward angulation. So in bargain, we achieved increased safety profile of the instrument, reduced complications, and smooth transition to the next step, that is chopping, especially in hard cataracts. And our modified dialers worked equally well as choppers up to grade three or four nucleus and increased the safety, especially in the hands of beginners. So this is a video in which dialer was, angle dialer was used for mature cataract. And you can see that minimal manipulation of the port was seen. And the axis of the dialer aligned with the axis of the FACO probe, and we could break the uh, nucleus very easily. Similarly, angle chopper was used in case of soft cataract, uh, I mean, it's the third to fourth grade of nucleus cataract, and uh, we could achieve the, di um, the breakage of the nucleus very smoothly. Even in the case of corneal opacity, breaking of nucleus could be easily achieved with the help of this dialer or chopper. And effectively, the clear corneal area was used to complete the FACO emulsification part. Here's, a, here's our use of this instrument in soft cataract cases. As you can see, there is already, already a crater formation and how this instrument was used to break the nucleus into two halves very smoothly. And this is our last case, a hard cataract. And so easily this nucleus was uh, broken into small pieces with the help of this angulated dialer or chopper, whichever you are comfortable with. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Major Sisti, for uh, making it uh, quite simple whether to use a dialer or chopper. Now I welcome uh, Colonel Vijay Sharma, HOD Ophthalmology at FMC Pune to present the next topic, Back Fixation versus Lensectomy in Sublaxated Cataract. So uh, good afternoon. Uh, back Fixation versus Lensectomy. Now, uh, as we know that uh, uh, zonular dehiscence can happen in uh, trauma, it can happen during uh, complicated cataract surgery, uh, it can happen uh, in ectopial lenses, uh, as in Marfan syndrome and other syndromes, and also pseudo-expoliation syndrome. So how do you manage such cases of zonular dehiscence? You have got so, uh, so many options. Uh, when you do a nucleotomy techniques, at that time you should use a capsular hooks rather than iris hooks, and you can uh, hold on to the side where there is a zonular dehiscence. Uh, then in cases there is a up to 90 degree or 3 clock hour of dehiscence, you can use a uh, normal CTR. Uh, otherwise, if uh, dehiscence is more than that, you can use a single eyelet or a double eyelet CONE ring. Also, you have got capsular uh, segments which you can use nowadays. So all the, these options are available. Now, uh, I'll just show a few, uh, just two videos uh, related to this. Now, if you see this, this is a post-traumatic cataract. There is a uh, capsular, uh, posterior capsular uh, uh, break was there and that had healed. Now, uh, you have to go very slowly in such case because you may have uh, dehiscence in such cases whenever you're doing the surgery or onion peel uh, rexis was done, first a small and then larger. And once you uh, uh, have completed the rexis, as you can see, in uh, you just emulsify the nucleus. And once you have completed the, so, you just see it here now. Uh, so it is very important to note. Now, uh, just note uh, inferiorly at uh, 4 and 5 o'clock, you can see that there is a dehiscence. Dehiscence is around uh, 3 o'clock hours. So in such situation, how do you manage intraoperatively? So now you just inject viscoelastics so that the, all the bag uh, that goes into the place. And uh, once you have uh, injected viscoelastic, then you take the CTR. Uh, you inject the CTR. Again, uh, if you have a preloaded CTR, that is uh, uh, much better to inject uh, in a 
unloaded CTR. Now, I normally use a two dialer technique. Many people prefer to use a uh, forceps rather than a two dialer technique. So, in the two dialer technique, uh, remember that when you take it in, you have to take it inside the capsular uh, edge. Don't leave it just in the anterior chamber because otherwise, uh, otherwise it will be anterior to that. And uh, once we have put the uh, CTR in place, when your uh, uh, descent is uh, taken care of, then you can put an IL. Uh, now, the uh, Posterior capsular tear, which is healed now, that had maintained luckily during the entire surgery. It didn't open up, otherwise, we, would, we could have, uh, uh, we might have had to implant a uh, maybe a multi piece in the sulcus. So, this is one. And the second case uh, is about, uh, say, uh, this is about uh, Marfan syndrome with the uh, zonular dehiscence, significant zonular dehiscence, which is around 8 clock hours. Uh, so, how do you manage such cases? Such cases, uh, our preferred technique is uh, doing an intralenticular aspiration uh, followed by glued dialer. This was a 10 year old child with a Marfan syndrome. So, in this, I'll just go step by step. You just make the si uh, first you make the flaps. So, in the flaps, uh, uh, what our preferred technique is while you are making the flap, you make the flap much ahead. Uh, uh, you make a pocket also along with the flap. So you can see the yellow is the flap and there is a pocket, blue color. So in the blue color uh, flap, what you can do is when you have to implant the uh, glued IOL, you can put your uh, haptics into that pocket. Otherwise, you can use a Yamane techniques or uh, any of the newer uh, available techniques. Then you make a stab incision into the, uh, into the uh, lens. Once you make the stab incision, then through these two stab incision, you take your bimanual irrigation and aspiration port in th inside the uh, inside the lens, and just do a irrigation aspiration inside the lens. Now, what you will achieve is entire cortical matter, which is very soft. You can aspirate that completely by this, and nothing will go down into the uh, vitreous cavity. So, once you have achieved it, as we are seeing this, uh, do a good irrigation aspiration, remove entire cortex uh, from there. And uh, uh, also you can take help of your irrigation cannula to put the nucleus centrally because 8 clock hour subluxation is a big amount of sub subluxation. It, it keep, keeps going outside. Now once that is completed, you are left only with the capsular bag. And now just take, eat away the capsular bag using a cutter. It comes out very easily. Now you, you have got a very clean uh, uh, removal of the uh, subluxated lens. And uh, this is the time when you uh, make a 3.2 millimeter incision and after you have made the 3.2 millimeter incision, then you can uh, insert your multi-piece IOL. Uh, so uh, the technique is same. Uh, I'll, not uh, I'll not discuss it in detail, but uh, the leading haptic, uh, you hold it uh, uh, with the glued IOL forceps from the side, and similarly from the other side, once, uh, once you are extraizing, uh, uh, you can extraizing the trailing haptic as well. Once this is out, that is the time you can put a single suture at the main incision site, and uh, uh, you just tuck in those haptics into the pockets that you have created. So the, your bleed IOL is never under tension in this. And uh, uh, if you use a 26 gauge needle, uh, there may be some amount of tilt in the IOL, but uh, usually you do not get any tilt in this. And uh, then you just put a glued, uh, glue and uh, for the flap, uh, scleral flap followed by the conjunctival flap and you just close it. So to summarize, if you've got a less than 90 degree, uh, subluxation in that case, uh, less than 90 degrees zonal dehiscence, in that case you can use a CTR or a capsular segments. More than 90 degree you can use a CONI, single or double eyelet CONI and a capsular segments for ectopia lentis because it's a progressive zonular weakening because the pathology is there. So in such cases where there is a progressive pathology or zonular weakening, in those cases you can go ahead with the interlenticular aspiration and put a glued IOL in such cases. Thank you very much. Just one. Uh, just one comment, like as uh, uh, Vijay just suggested, in extreme scenarios, it is better to take out the lens and put in a multi uh, sorry glued IOL. That is one. And and second thing is, if you are starting, so it's easier to again do a lensectomy and do a glued IOL rather than going and fixing, trying to fix the back. It's very difficult to fix a back. So until as you are very conversant with fixing a back with a Sioni, it is much easier to do a lensectomy and doing a glued IOL. If somebody has to put in some effort in learning a surgery, probably the first thing you should learn is a glued IOL. That saves your day any day. Sioni is definitely, again, fixation is, it becomes difficult. Uh, thank you, Colonel Vijay. Now I, uh, now I invite Brigadier Sanjay Kumar Mishra.
एच ओ डी ऑप्थनोलॉजी एट आर्मी हॉस्पिटल आर एन आर डेली ही फॉर दिसनर्स ही इज द मोस्ट डेकोरेटेड आर्म फोर्सेज मेडिकल सर्विसेज ऑफिसर ही इज अ ग्रेजुएट एंड पोस्ट ग्रेजुएट ऑफ एफ एम सी एंड हैज डन इज फेलोशिप इन विट्रोडेटनल सर्जरी एट आर पी आर पी सेंटर ही इज क्रेडिटेड विद ऑपरेटिंग मैनी ऑफ द Uh, presidents of india and Thanks. to be uh, very frank he is a complete ophthalmologist he is well versed with all the surgeries of cataract refractive surgeries posterior segment surgeries oculoplasty vitreoretinal surgery you name a surgery and he is an expert of this brigadier sanjay mishra please <coughs> thank you sir for the generous word first of all uh, warm greetings from army hospital rnr and uh, as i always say that it's a pleasure to be a retina surgeon because it takes away all your fear for a cataract surgery so you can be a fearless surgeon so i shall i'll be presenting on uh, multifocal versus monofocal we this is the commonest doubt in a mind of a practitioner that what lens which lens when to use when not to use is very important in a surgery we what what you are supposed to do and what you are not supposed to do it's very very important you have to be very very clear in your mind i don't have any financial disclosure we all know these are the basic uh, uh, you know history we all know that how the intraocular lenses have evolved over years and what are the characteristics of uh, iol which has uh, been evolved from square edge to round edge to single piece to three piece spheric aspheric biconvex meniscus plano convex acrylic pmma columbar and silicon the optical principle of a non uh, accommodative eye it's basic on two principles that's the refractive and the diffractive principle so in the refractive uh, uh, non accommodative eyes we have two types that is bull's eye lens where there is a concentric central ring which is which is uh, for the near and which is surrounded by the distant vision and endless this is the 3 to 5 rings uh, the center one is for the distance here the center one is for the distance surrounded by the near and again surrounded by the distant vision the diffractive uh, uh, principal iols they have a convex uh, front anterior surface which is for the distance and the diffractive posterior surface which is given the additional power for the intermediate and the reading so we have this monofocal lenses where the complete light is used which is originating from the infinity and the diffractive principle where the light is broken into various parts where it is focused for the near as well as it is gradually dispersing for the intermediate region so we have uh, multiple studies which have uh, concluded from the monofocal and the multifocal the advantages of the monofocal lens that it gives you a uncorrected distal visual activity which is very good it preserves your contrast and there are no glares or dyspotopsias uh for the multifocals it gives you a less dependence less dependence on glasses a better uncorrected dist uh, distance intermediate and near vision so the what are the pros of uh, a monofocal lens that it does not generate halos very very important the level of acceptance is very high almost everybody accepts a monofocal lens the contrast or the mtr function of this lens is high that means you have a good contrast it uh, guarantees a good binocular vision for the distance it does not require any neuro adaptation and for most of the activities patient can uh, see without glasses but will definitely require glasses for intermediate and near vision what are the con for uh, multifocal that all the vision if you see the distance intermediate and near vision may not be as sharp as compared to monofocal but you do get everything but slightly lesser than the monofocal you are not very sure of your outcome for this you have to be 100% certain that your iol power correction everything what you have taken to think is perfectly on you tend to get ghost images the contrast is definitely on the lower side it requires neuro adaptation and if not centered well 
can cause a monocular diplopia. So we have seen that as the, as the surgical techniques, as the machines have advanced, so is the requirement and the expectations of your patients. You now have a very, very demanding patients and uh, they want everything, whatever best is possible, you, they want everything. And uh, to cater for that, the quality of lenses have also gone a huge revolution. So uh, the advances which we have seen from a multifocal lens, which earlier generation multifocal lens was not exactly multifocal, but it was a bifocal lens, where it was fixed for the distance and the near. There was no intermediate vision. And then came the trifocal, which had three points of fixation. Then came the EDOF lenses, the extended depth of uh, focus, where it delivers a depth of focus for intermediate and a functional near. Uh, it has both diffractive and non-diffractive lenses. It closes slight halos and glares. For example, like uh, uh, Symphony, Techno Symphony, VVT, and Luxmart. The monofocal plus lenses, this is not what is the vogue in monofocal plus lenses. It is a refractive monofocal lens with a modified optic to offer intermediate vision. The example is Technis eye hands. And the continuous range of vision, that means it is hybrid kind of, it is both the EDOF as well as monofocal lens so that it, you get a continuous range of vision. For example, a Technis synergy lenses. So what is a monofocal lens? Monofocal plus lens is which gives you a, in addition to a quality distant vision, it gives you an enhanced, enhanced intermediate vision for patient to do daily tasks with less dependency on glasses. We have seen uh, the near vision, what we have calculated is for 40 centimeters from eye, intermediate at 66 and distance at four meters. Uh, the criteria for uh, intermediate vision is that uh, the EDOF lenses requires to implant to have a monocular distance uncorrected intermediate vision of 20 by 32, that is 612 in more than 50% of cases. So how does it differ? How, do, how does the monofocal lens differ from a true monofocal lens? The, if you see the, the characteristics of a, uh, of a monofocal lens is almost same as a monofocal lens. Where it dis differs is the design and material that it uses a higher order A sphere. So uh, when you demystify the optics of a monofocal lens, it could be a spherical aberration based optic design or a aspheric optic design, zonal or non-diffractive design and higher order aspheric design. We see that op optical, the spherical based design, it, it causes the, the focus at different points so the images are not sh sharp. The aspheric design is refractive oil which uh, gives you a very sharp distant vision but patient will require glasses for intimate vision. The zonal on a diffractive uh, design, you, there's an abrupt disrupt of uh, disruption in power. Uh, it has a larger halo pattern compared to a standard monofocal, but it has a low MTF. That means that contrast becomes a little lesser in these cases. And also they are pupillary size dependent lenses. And then comes a higher order aspheric lens, which I said is like eye hands. It has a refractive technology. That means there are no, the, no uh, rings zones or sphericity and based on a continuous higher order aspheric. That means the power from the periphery to the center is in a slightly increasing power. So the lens, the thickness of the lens in the center is slightly thicker as compared to the other monofocal, but the power slightly increases so that you get a complete depth of uh, vision in these lenses. So we are, the study which has compared uh, the, the eye hands that is a uh, IANS lens with the standard monofocal lenses, it had a improved intermediate vision as uh, seen in the chart. And also the distant vision, very important that distant vision, that is IO, uh, IO, uh, the vision of 2020 or better for distant vision is almost same in, in uh, both these lenses. Uh, it is not associated with any glistening and uh, it does not cause light scattering and therefore the contrast is not reduced in these lenses. The dysphotopsia's profile of uh, Technis IANS is similar to Technis 1 platform. So if you see this, uh, it is almost, if you see this, this lens is exactly like, uh, you can't differentiate uh, IANS lens from a standard monofocal lens. And earlier when the lens was launched, there were restrictive criteria that these are the criteria where you use. Now we have seen that it is, you please, it should be treated like any other monofocal lenses and there is no, no uh, differentiative criteria uh, from the standard monofocal lens. 
So what advantages it gives that you require intermediate vision for your day-to-day -day working. That means when you're, you know, you're doing your daily activities like shaving, you're reading your computers, you're working with a distance, you're playing cards, you're playing golf. These are things which you achieve with a, a very, very uh, uh, crisp results. So we have a uh, uh, huge experience of uh, this uh, IANS lens in our center. If you see that we have implanted more than 4,000 lenses and uh, in almost 95.2% of cases we have achieved a vision of distance vision of 6.6 six. and intermediate vision is uh, in 90.8% N10 vision and in 10.2% we could achieve N6 though, the, though its literature says that it's a, do not uh, promise for a near vision of N6. But uh, my experience that how we could achieve a good N6 vision is that you have to choose your patient and do a micro mono vision in these cases. Most of your patient will be happy with your micro mono vision. That is the dominant eye, you make it a 6 6 for the distance, and the non dominant eye, you give a little uh, myopic shift so that the patient achieves a good intermediate and a near, workable near, workable near vision. So this is, uh, these are my two patients, uh, very, I mean, most elite patient you can, uh, you can even think of, that you're operating on these two patients is a very, very huge challenge. Uh, the first thing, what I'm always asked, that which lens did you implant in these cases? So here, here are the cases where you don't want any, any complaint from your patient because even the slightest of a complaint can create a lot of problems for you. Uh, with the blessing of God, I always say that all these surgeries, you have to have blessing of God, whatever. You may be the best surgeon in the world, but you, you have to have the blessing. So with the blessings, uh, my, both the patients achieved 6-6 uh, vision for the distance and N10 for reading. So uh, uh, when I met my patient once, he was reading without even for the, N, for the smaller vision or he was reading without glasses. So I asked him, so why do you use your glasses when you don't require glasses? He says, Dr. Saab, it's my political compulsion. So yeah. my photos are, you know, everywhere my photos are there with the glasses, so I cannot take out my glasses now. So on the lighter note, but both of them are extremely, extremely nice patients. They've been very, very humble, and it was a real pleasure and my honor to uh, be their surgeon. Uh, my experience with other EDOF lenses, that I have used a lot of uh, uh, Acusoft uh, VVT lens also. So it uses a proprietary technology of a... I'm going a little overboard because I have saved time from my previous speakers. They finished off a little early, so I'm going a little extra time on this. So they use a non-diffractive option, and you have a two-transition zone. So there is a zone, one which is in the center, which is uh, the slightly elevated smooth platform, and a transition zone which is center. There's a bump in the center. Normally, you can't make out in the, uh, the bump uh, in these cases, uh, but... Uh, uh, there's, if you see carefully, when you're operating the microscope or seeing in a slit lamp, there's a small central bump. That bump is the, uh, the thing which acts in these lenses. Uh, the, uh, the dysphotopsia profile of uh, both VVT and the actus of IQ is almost same, that hardly any of these patients complain of uh, dysphotopsia, that is a uh, starburst or other uh, symptoms. We've also used... Uh, uh, Lux Smart, which is from the Boston Lom. It's, uh, uh, it's based on pure refractive optics principle. It's a four point fixation. Uh, again, it has uh, got a peripheral uh, region, elongated focus center, and a patented transition zone. So, this is how it is. Uh, it's a beautiful lens, it fixes well, and you can't, there's no central bump, so there's, you can't differentiate it uh, from the other monofocal lenses. If you, if you see, uh, even under the microscope, you will see that it looks like a, a, a monofocal lens. The other one is uh, the minimal lenses. We have used not much, but again, is uh, acts on the same principle with uh, almost uh, similar results. So uh, this is uh, uh, the last category is that hybrid, multifocal, and EDOF lenses. That means it's got a combination of... Uh, both uh, the EDOF lenses and the trifocality so that the patient gets a much better as compared to the other EDOF lenses. The other EDOF lenses like Symphony and all, uh, the, the, uh, the reading is little compromised. So again, you have to do a micro -mono vision. And, but these lenses like Synergy gives you a very uh, bet, uh, better uh, reading 
than the other uh, uh, EDOF lenses. So, in conclusion, the intermediate vision is, the, is need of an R in the current lifestyle. Photic phenomena is similar to standard monofocal can be a good choice. Minimize ocular wavefront abrasion and optimize retinal image quality. And these are the things you must do before uh, performing surgery that you have to select, especially if you're doing, these are, these are things when you're doing a, if you're doing a monofocal lens, it's fine. But if you're doing a multifocal or a lenses, you must select your patients and uh, they must be fitting into criteria of uh, that they are fitting into, that they can be used like should not have an coronal opacity, should not have an astigmatism. You need to counsel your patient well. Don't pro over promise because if you over promise, the expectations are very high. <laughs> Patients in all these multifocal lenses do have an immediate post operative uh, phase. They will have some problems. They will have rings. They will have halos. And you have to tell them that they have to bear uh, with these halos and till the neuroadaptation happens and they will become all right. Uh, very important to have a very, very accurate IOL power because you cannot err on this. This is a very, very important aspect. Uh, when you're using especially multifocal lenses, you cannot err, err on this because if you do it, however surgery, however good surgery is there, you will end up having a, a, a very complaining patient. The tear surface analysis is very important because if you have dryness, the patient is going to be uncomfortable. You have to treat your uh, tear film uh, or dryness before doing the surgery. And any other ocular pathology, like if the patient is a case of a glaucoma or a PDR, diabetic retinopathy, please avoid using a multifocal lenses and choose your patient well, counsel your patient well, and you will have a very good results. And you will have a good uh, people following that people will follow wherever you go, people will come and, uh, you know, you, the word of mouth goes, and uh, that's how you do well in your life. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Brigadier Sanjay Mishra, for making the topic of choosing the, which I will to use. Uh, in the best manner one can explain. <coughs> uh, uh, the, all the questions, all the speakers are here. Any questions from the audience? Uh, Mike, please. Quite in favor of, or I, I Mike, Mike, please, Mike, please. Huh. I felt that uh, from your, uh, you were very happy with the monofocal plus, if I'm not mistaken. How does a monofocal plus near vision compare to a, let's say, a symphony vivity near vision? So as I said, a monofocal plus, like if you call it as a eye hands lens, please do not promise your patient N6. It is not a lens which is going to give you N6. So always say that you will require glass. But all this, remember these patients, Never treat this patient as a monofocal lens in the sense, if you give this patient an addition of 2.5 for reading, he's going to be a very, very unhappy patient because the reading will become almost close to the eye. So the, all these patients, because of the technology, the reading is, you do not uh, give an uh, addition of more than 1.5. So if you do a little micro mono vision, that if you go a little myopic in the other eye, no, the, pay, the, the, the literature of uh, this lens says that you achieve uh, emetropia in both eyes. But I've seen with more than 4,000, 5,000 lenses, you can go for a, clearly you can go for a micro mono vision and you can have N8 vision. You, still you will not get an N6 vision. But how does it compare with a VVT or I agree? No, no, definitely VVT, VVT will have a better reading VVT. vision. Yeah, 100%. Okay. Because even VVT, we do not promise N6 for that. We probably Exactly. So that's what I said. Six. It will have a better reading. That is, the near vision will be much better as compared to eye hands because it is okay. projected as a EDOF. It's a true EDOF lens. So there is a there is a bump which I said in the center that that uses that technology for give you a workable near vision. So it is not said key near vision, but it is uh, literature says a workable near vision. So if you have a uh, a six six and an N eight in one, one eye you can go for a 6-9 and N6 for the other eye. So when the patient is uh, uh, reading binocularly, he's with a little increase in the, ask the patient to go a little, increase the distance. So at a little uh, more uh, distance for reading, he can most of the time do a, especially like laptop or even mobile work comfortably. 
But if you say that you go for reading newspaper, he may have little problem reading newspapers. I fully agree. I also tell them to increase the illumination. Yes, that's very important to tell the patient to increase your light so that more light is available to the, all your patients. Because all these lenses, the contrast goes down as compared to the normal monofocal lenses. The contrast is slightly lesser. So you have to uh, tell the patient to increase little, uh, little brightness so the patient will become more comfortable. And one last comment. If I used to tell them that you may read. Now I tell them you will not read without glasses because I have had patients when you have told them that you have told me you may read without glasses, I cannot. The reverse is when I have told them you will not read and they say, I say, oh wow, then your God has given you very good news. This, this is how you convince your patient and win over your patients. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for attending this. Thank you so much.